right. Hi, everybody. We are back Hi again. together again. <laughs> um, our topic for this call is reviewing last year in preparation for planning for next year. And so we will talk a little bit about that. But first, I wanted to open us in prayer and we'll pray um, the come Holy Spirit. So let's begin in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit. Amen. Come Holy Spirit, fill the hearts of thy faithful and enkindle in them the fire of thy love. Send forth thy spirit and they, spirit, shall, be they shall be created. And thou, and thou shalt renew the face of the earth. Let us pray. O God, who did instruct the hearts of the faithful by the light of the Holy Spirit, grant us in the same spirit to be truly wise and ever to rejoice in his consolation. Amen. Amen. Ah, so yes, we need the Holy Spirit to have these deep thoughts and go through these kinds of thinking exercises. Um, what I shared earlier this week when we did first part of this call and then sharing again today is, you know, we too often skip over this step when we're getting ready for the next school year or the next thing in our lives or the next whatever. Um, because as moms, it's constant stuff. Like there's no stop and get a break to think through the future or the past. There's just go, go, go. We're responsible for all kinds of things all the time. Especially right now, it seems like it's all falling on us to like fix everything <laughs> and like, you know, make it all better. And there's, you know, obviously not much we can do, but um, so I think it's crucial. And this survey came up as a result of a group of friends and I in Miami uh, wanted to come up with a way that we could do that, that would help moms go through the process of really thinking the important thoughts um, before we sit down and plan. And as I mentioned before, there's lots of ways to do this. You know, people do different ways of reviewing your year. Um, I know, Charlotte, you shared that you have, like, monthly checks. There you go. Um, uh, Leslie was sharing some stuff. Like, they, you know, they regularly check on how they're doing, how it meets their goals. Um, I just do it at the end of the year. I feel like the year is, like, full speed ahead. And this is why, because this tool, this survey that I have out there is um, – is a way to do that, but there's lots of other ways to do that. So it's not the only way, I guess is my point. Um, and the survey came about, like I said, some moms wanted help, like kind of newer homeschool moms wanted help planning their school year. And we were trying, a group of kind of seasoned homeschool moms were trying to figure out, well, how do we help people? How do we do that? And we realized that after talk, talking to some of these moms, nobody really thinks about, well, what was last year like? and what worked and what didn't work in order to plan for the next year. They just keep going to the next thing because shiny new curriculum. <laughs> and I think there's funny memes out there that say, we've gotten to the point of the school year where planning for next year is more fun than finishing up this year. Um, and we're gonna chat a little in the group, hopefully tomorrow about like how we finish this year or what we need to finish. I've gotten a few questions on like, well, how do I know when I can just say we're done? And I think that's a good question. Um, but these kinds of questions in the survey help us get there. So that being said, I'd love to hear um, if there's any, um, anything you'd like to share about your process or this particular survey, if you've looked at it this week and just kind of a general, what, did, what are you thinking? How is, is it, you know, is whatever process is that, um, do you see how that could be beneficial? Or are you still kind of sorting through that? Thoughts from you ladies? I'm going to go get mine. I'll be right back. That's fine. Yeah. They're pondering. That's good. That's good. Because that's the point, right? Is to make ourselves stop and think like what, what's going well. Um, the, sur the survey that we came up with has four specific sections. Um, the first one looks at mom internally, our personal spirituality, our personal strengths and faults and what we need to do to be the mom, to be able to teach the kids. Um, so I think that first section is really key that we look at ourselves. And then the second section looks at the struggles that we have in homeschooling and parenting with our children, um, mostly related to homeschooling, but there's discipline in there and things like that, lesson planning, curriculum, all those kind of questions. What are my struggles? What's really didn't go well this year? 
And then the third section asks almost the same exact questions, but phrases it for successes. And I think it's crucial that we look at what's going well, what did work, because a lot of times we forget, or I forget, what went really well and what we shouldn't stop doing because it gets boring <laughs> when it works. But um, if it works, keep doing it. And then section four, which I want to spend a little bit of time with you guys later, is goal setting. Is that you look back on me, our homeschool struggles, our homeschool successes, and try to figure out how do I apply that to next year or to the next thing or the next season, whatever that is. Because you can do this at any point. It doesn't have to be the end of the school year. It's just the way we developed it. So anything um, from your perspective on thoughts that have come to mind and what, uh, what things you think about when you're moving forward? What do you look back and, and reflect on the most or need to if you don't? Well, I'm gonna take one particular child. <laughs> My younger son, tw he's 12. And um, before this year, we did Seton, and it was just an oh, awful struggle. Um, so I decided this year, but right at the end of the summer, which, you know, it was too late, really, to, to change, because <clears throat> um, I didn't have enough time, really, to figure it all out. This, it's called the Robinson Method. I don't know if you've ever heard of it, but mm -hmm. it's the three R's with four R's with religion, but and it's, they work independently. And um, so I like it. Um, my son has worked quite independently. He needs a little work on his writing still, but he's not too bad. Um, but he's... He sailed through the math without me. Um, and they read, they read a lot of books and write on what they've read. Um, so now he's decided he wants to go back to see me. I oh. doesn't know why. He can he can never answer like a question. It's always I don't know. I don't know if anybody has kids like that. <laughs> um, preteen and teen boys, yes, <laughs> and maybe girl. <laughs> well, the he tween, doesn't. The tween girl, yes, the tween girls yes. like that. Uh, I dread going back to Seton. I wonder if, if it's because um, it seemed like anyway he needed a lot of my help with Seton, <laughs> and this year I, I think he's learned quite a bit just from reading. Mm -hmm. His writing has improved. The math, I, I didn't stick with Saxon. I took teaching textbooks and it was, cause he's not gonna be a math person anyway. So, and it was just very good for him. He was able to get through it. But now he wants to go back to Seton. <laughs> so he needs to answer these questions <laughs> and think about. Yeah, maybe, yeah. What worked well and what didn't work well with this year and what worked well and didn't work well with Seton. <laughs> good idea. That's so tough. Okay. Okay. I'll take that suggestion. <laughs> it's hard because they, I mean, I think we all have a tendency to say grass is always greener and it's hard to identify, you know, very specific things about what we're doing that works or not. I just find my kids sometimes, I don't like it. But then when you ask them why, it's not that they don't like it. It's that they don't like the way we're doing it or they don't like, you know, if I, the, to them, like they think too big instead of just like each thing. Like you mentioned, you thought maybe perhaps why he liked Seton is because he was with you more and doing it with you more. Mm -hmm. But if that's the reason, is it really Seton or, or is it really, he needs you to be engaged in right. some way right. or something, you know, so there's right. a, thing. and if he was given an option, that's the other mm -hmm. thing. I think my kids sometimes don't realize that there are other options like okay well we could keep doing this but we could add on something that we do together mm -hmm. so that you can still do this simpler program you know I, I, I can't think of an example of my kids but I know that they just like don't there's like I just don't like it <laughs> <laughs> that's what that's what I that's what I have mm -hmm. seen but I think those are all good things for you guys mm -hmm. to talk about together okay yeah, using the, this guy. did you see the thread um, 
yesterday maybe about how do you motivate your teens and your older no. kids. Um, I think there were three or four of us that commented, how do you motivate them? And every one of us said, we consult them about the curriculum. We consult them about what they want to learn. And we have those conversations so that it's kind of, they're invested in it and it's on them okay. and they have to do it even if, you know, so I think that mm -hmm. that's the age when we do that. We sit down with them and we say, what, mm -hmm. what can we do? Selena, you're nodding a lot. Yeah. So my oldest, we got her a boxed curriculum for third grade and we just did everything with it and it worked really well. So we did it again in fourth grade and in fourth grade, the history changed and went from a mom involved project to a workbook and she did it. She didn't like it but she did it because it was what her, she wanted to do it on her own. She didn't like it because her sister was doing a separate history curriculum that involved me more. And so for this year, we switched, instead of doing two different curriculums, we're all together, all four of us, and I just have three separate expectations from the three different children based on their age and their development. So, because she was listening into the audiobooks and she would see her sister do these cool reviews with mom. She's like, well, I want to be involved. So then she wasn't enthusiastic about her work. And then it created more work for me at the end of the month review. Like, so how are you with history? She's like, well, I guess I'll take some time to look through it, mom. Do you want me to read with you? I do. I'm like, okay, well then we sat there for two hours on a Friday afternoon <laughs> reading through history and it wasn't fun for either of us. So I'm nodding my head because it took me working with her to figure out what she wanted and to figure out what she, how she wanted to move forward, what she wanted different, to plan for fifth and sixth grade because we're meshing fifth and sixth grade into one year this year for her. Mm -hmm. So I'm nodding my head because it took a couple of conversations over a month, I would say three or four conversations to figure out where was she frustrated? Why was she frustrated? Was she not being pushed enough? Was she not being challenged? Was she bored? Um, which areas were too challenging that she needed more help on? And then me prioritizing it in my calendar and saying no to a few things that maybe they brought, they were fun, but they weren't necessarily uplifting or spiritually renewing to me as a mother. Like social things for me that were play dates for her. Well. They're fun for me. I'm with my friends and I get to spend time with people that I like, but there was no one there for her. So like cutting those out of our calendar gave us a little more free time and gave us a little bit more one-on-one -on -one time where her sister and brother could run off and I could spend some time with her. Cause she's starting middle school mm -hmm. in a year and it's a big deal and I need to take it seriously just like she is. So it was good to see that reciprocation on her part that she is taking it seriously she does have a vested interest in her education. I need to have a vested interest as well and just give her that one-on-one -on -one time that is so precious at mm -hmm. this age when they're transitioning to teen. It's mm -hmm. so weird and beautiful. <laughs> yes. <laughs> Definitely. So. No, that's awesome. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Having those conversations with our kids, mm -hmm. it's crucial. I think mm -hmm. me too, when I'm sitting down to have those conversations or with my kids or also with my husband, we've talked about husbands a bit and finding out what are they, you know, what do they see as um, the, the struggles and successes in our homeschooling. But um, like they make me think more again about my priorities and my goals. So that when I can respond to them, I can respond to them better when I think about my own goals and my own priorities for our homeschooling. I mean, when I say my own, I mean, obviously it's still, all of us, but I have the, my husband will say the pedagogical mind that is planning it. And mm -hmm, so mm -hmm. when I have my long view, I can say to them, okay, I hear you and this is valid and maybe we can figure something out. But also a priority for me is that we do X, Y, Z. And that's not, we, I mean, we can't, you know, sometimes they don't mesh. And so I can say back to them, so how can you help me figure out how to accomplish X, Y, Z within what you're requesting as well. So like you said, you know, Selena, that with, with the history, it was like we had to switch, you know, to doing something all together and you had to have more time to give to her. That was like a shift that 
you had to figure out how to adapt with her, but also keep your priorities right. Um, well, I think my son, um, that may be what he's looking for. With Seton, I was, it was just a negative experience, but I was with him a lot to try to get him to get the work done. Mm -hmm. And um, I just assumed he didn't want me to help him <laughs> because he would like push me away, mm -hmm. um, not listen, not do what I was asking him to do. And so I decided, well, maybe working independently would be good. And um, doesn't need the workbooks. Um, I think Seton gets away from that eventually anyway in high school, but so I thought he would like working independently, but I think it's turned out that um, he still needs me to help him. So I have to figure this out how I can. Yeah. It's a tricky age because more. they, they want your help, but they don't. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So a lot of yeah. times it's like just being in the room or just being mm -hmm. available until they get that. So they hit that transition and keep mm -hmm. going. But it's all about, you know, it's all about that. What are we trying to accomplish here? You know, and I think um, when we take in the thinking about mom, thinking about our struggles and successes and start looking at how does this fit into the conversation about what comes next? It's why do I homeschool? What are my priorities? What am I hoping to accomplish? Like those big questions that you're like, ah. Um, I think I comment, or I know I commented in the group on that, one of those questions that, um, in Sarah McKenzie's book, Teaching from Rest, she has a great thing at the beginning talking about um, imagine your child who is in college and is out meeting with some new friends and they're all like, so you were homeschooled. What was that like? And what do you want your kid to say? And use that as kind of a guiding principle of what do you want them to say? Now, does, is what you're doing right now reflect that? Because if mm -hmm. not, then that's a good guide for you to try to, you mm -hmm. know, to, to add to your goals. I think that's one component of it is what do we want that to look like? Um, what atmosphere do we want to create in our home? Um, what do we want them to think about homeschooling? I know there's these articles going around right now about how awful homeschooling supposedly is and all the rebuttals describing what it's really like. You know, how would you describe what it's really like mm -hmm. in the positive way? And that influences like, okay, I need to choose between, you know, just to use Selena's example, I need to choose between my kids sticking with this, you know, box curriculum history that we're not doing together, they're not enjoying, and they're really struggling, or, you know, coming up with more plans, figuring it all out again, including her in the, the group, you know, group lessons. But we can think about those things based on our goals because in some families it might be good to say no you got to do this got to stick with the curriculum yes. um i can think of i mean she's younger but like a, as you get a little bit older just as an example so what if their goal is to get into a specialized um post post high school program maybe it's even N ncaa stuff like if those are some goals you have to be much more rigid about the expectations but if those aren't your goals you know, if you know you have a kid who's likely not headed off to college ever, or you have a kid who is, um, you know, is not going to go mathy sciencey, or it is going to go mathy sciencey, then you're going to make decisions differently, um, and you start to see that in those tween teen years as to where they're headed. Um, but even in the younger years, you can kind of be thinking, what what is it we're trying to accomplish here? What are, you know, I know, Charlotte, you have talked several times about your goal being for them to learn how to learn. Right. And that's, that probably makes it easier for you to decide how to pick curriculum and how to, you know, set goals for them. And you can look at each kid and say, how are they doing with that? Um, I think that's, you know, it's really great to kind of identify that. So that's what the goal setting section does is it, it takes those, takes all the information. Um, you know, it talks about you yourself, what are your virtues? What are your gifts and talents as a mom and how can, and what's your personality and how do you apply that? We've talked before about how, um, Selena, you're great at this, but if mom, you know, you got to consider mom, you got to make sure that mom is going to be happy doing this curriculum. You got to be, you know, that mom is going to be happy doing it at this time of day in this method because otherwise it's not good because <laughs> mom, 
you know, not that we all have to cater as only to mom, but that has to be taken into con huge consideration because mm -hmm. we're the one that does it. Um, you know, are we including our faith in all those things? Prayer life, sacramental life, liturgical year, um, leaving the house. How is all that playing into? Are we doing the right activities? And now everybody's going, I don't know what I'm doing because no one's leaving. And next year looks so foreign. But um, all those things have to factor into before you pick the curriculum. And so I think that's what I'm trying, that's what the survey tries to get across is that you have to like in your head or on paper, compile all this, these considerations and then make decisions. Cause I've had years where I haven't done any of that. And I just picked what I picked. And I was like, why did I pick this? Like what, this is not working. This is a disaster. Um, so let me ask you a few questions from this last section and see if any of you want to um, jump in and share anything that's come to you. Um, Let's see, which ones did I pick? Um, so basically, is there anything that you have thought of that's been a success this year that you would really like to build on for next year that you would like to repeat or carry on or kind of expand? Anything come to mind, a big success you had that you wanna continue on the spot? Okay, I'll go. So our big success, last year that we really focused on was the liturgical calendar of the saints feast day and focusing on the kids saints so their baptismal saint their namesake saint my husband and i are confirmation saints and remembering those feast days of each kid's baptisms and going back and talking about what it was what it was like to celebrate that sacrament when they were a baby because that's something my parents never really talked about was their wedding day, my baptismal day. We, none of those were really big memories for them, but it's such an important part of my husband's life since he is a convert and he converted as a young adult. So it's all fresh in his mind. And so we're trying to build upon that for them to decide, you know, get them to, in, to know the saints really well so they can pick a saint that fits their charism when it's time for their confirmation. Um, for our younger two, we're going through the process of First Communion preparation together. And so they're starting to review the day and examination of conscience at the end of the day. And then again, you know, during lunch on the weekends with dad, but now dad's home. Mm -hmm. But just really taking those sacraments to heart and how they can, they do have the power to form and shape our souls. And their grace is powerful for our lives. And if we honor them the way they are, they can make a big change in their life long term. Um, one of the books we read this year was Chronicles of Narnia, like the breath of Aslan was a common theme throughout those novels. And the kids are like, mom, that's like the Holy Spirit breathing in our lives. Like, yes, yes. They get it. They're getting it. <laughs> but that was the positive formation change this past year was getting to know the saints and the sacraments and how they can Form our lives. Awesome. I love that. I love that. Charlotte or Marianne, anything come to mind that was a, a success this year that you want to carry on? So we started using extra math this year to practice our math facts, and it has been amazing mm. because my child who really struggles with of getting all that like you know because he's been practicing it on there and he can do it now <laughs> oh. so that has been our biggest win that's awesome i love extra math it's x t r a math dot org and it's totally free and it's just drill and it's wonderful because there's different ways they do it and yeah we're gonna pull it out again this summer I'm, we're gonna do some addition and subtract addition and multiplication review stuff and then that's going to be their like practice because my kids anything they get to do on the computer is like awesome <laughs> they're like ah um that's really cool that's really cool marianne was there anything that came out of this year that was a real positive that you want to continue are you still pondering um, that? well yeah speaking of math my 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 younger son finally memorized his math facts now he's in seventh grade the whole thing has been very difficult for me because when I went to school, we didn't proceed with any math concept until we knew all our math facts. Math 
would be spent writing the math facts, drilling them, the teacher at home at night, you'd have to drill, write them out. So I, but I would say by third grade, we were into other math concepts because by then the math facts were memorized, but I just had to maybe come to an acceptance that um, they weren't gonna learn them. And finally he did, but the other guy with his dyslexia, I don't know if he'll ever learn them all. <laughs> yeah. He just looks them up on the, um, the you know, the guides. Mm -hmm. He's doing his problems, but, but I, I tried the extra math too. And it just, I don't know. I just decided to stick with the flashcards. Yeah. You know, finally they learned them, but I guess it's pretty common. Even in schools, they don't learn them uh, early on. Um, yeah. I find, I, I find people tell me that the drilling of things isn't a very popular concept in schools today no matter what they're drilling I don't know but I had it is some, boring it, yeah it is boring but I had some kids that that just got their math facts and then some kids that still count on their fingers at age 17 and I'm like what well, I tried um that's okay it's interesting how each kid is different and they need something different so that's fantastic mm -hmm. that he found a way to to memorize them that's good good yeah I think um Gosh, I just think, um, I think of my two middle boys, um, when I think of successes this year and my older son, uh, this was his freshman year and I was, gave him a heavier workload, you know, the materials, just that next step up. And I kind of always wondered how he would do with it. And he's just done so well and doing really, um, great with it that I find in retrospect, I didn't, I wanted him to have like more exposure to the work, but not like and now you have to take this test and it's going to be really hard and you have to study and figure it out. But like, cause I wanted him to just have the uh, practice of studying and getting to know this harder material. And now I'm like, he's done so well. I really should have been also doing the testing and also giving him those assessments. So I'll have to capitalize on his, his, uh, his jump to that next level of academics um, and, and, and use that next year. And then my next son, this was the first year that he really has been able to do a chunk of his school independently. Um, and I'm, I'm very big on getting my kids capable of doing independent work. And um, I think we have to, to some degree, I definitely still plan to do certain things with them, but I want them to be able to feel confident to learn on their own. And he's finally in that place starting January, really, where he could, he can mm -hmm. go off and do some school and it gets done, which is amazing for him with his executive functioning. Um, and come back. So those are the two things I'm going to capitalize on. And really, um, now that he's capable of doing that, I can kind of make sure that the things that he's doing on his own are really good things. So I did pick a few things this year just to get him working on his own. <laughs> I'm like, he doesn't really need this, but he'll do it by himself. So yeah. Okay. So, um, the other question I want to highlight is not really, it's kind of a conglomeration of some of these questions, but so that we don't pick on our kids too much, uh, we pick on mom. Um, what is it that maybe you can think back on this year that you need to be doing better for next year as mom? One of the things I did not do well was review my daughter, my oldest child's work at the end of the week. Uh, we were just out and about on Fridays and out and about in the middle of the week on in the afternoons and just not really focusing on reviewing her work. And she had good sentence structure. She had good handwriting. She had quality work. Uh, but sometimes it just wasn't the right answer whatsoever. And it wasn't <laughs> content whatsoever. <laughs> so, like, oh, I should probably be reviewing more often. So now that we're home, we can spend our mornings on Fridays reviewing all the work that she's done that week. And I realize that when we do get back to whatever schedule we will have this summer, that that has to be an intentional pro process. Mm -hmm. Two, three hours, one-on-one -on -one with mom, a fun read aloud that we are doing together, but also reviewing her work and asking the questions this past month, what did you like? What did you not like? Because mm -hmm. I've come to realize there are some friendships we had last year that weren't really conducive to her faith life and her relationships that weren't really helpful to her. And mm -hmm. I had no idea. 
I mean, I just, I, like I said before, I enjoyed the mom relationship and I had no idea that she was not happy or have, not having fun in the situation. So we can kind of talk, well, is it because your personality that you're not having fun at this event? Or is it because there's no one your age? Or is it because there's no one that you connect with? What is, let's try to have those conversations. Because that, that's where we get our socialization. That's where we learn our personality, learn our weaknesses and our strengths is in those homeschool social times. And I have to make those intentional for her just to get her to learn to socialize. Right. Yeah. And that's part of, that's part of homeschooling. That's a skill that we are obligated to teach our kids is how to be social, how to be mm -hmm. with other people. And we have to factor that in. There have been years where I've like, you know, car you have to carve out time when you realize you're missing it. You're like, oh, that kid's not getting anything. That kid doesn't have enough friends. You've got to like figure out, okay, how can I carve it out for that kid? And do that. That's really wise. And I've learned, I've learned through this quarantine time that she really doesn't know how to talk to people online. Like she, she can't do this sort of Zoom meetings. She's like, she just shuts down, talk. Like, so we've like, okay, let's ask some questions. Let's learn to talk to our friends because this might not be the last time that we do this. We might do a virtual class in middle school and have to learn to talk and engage. So right. it's been a fun experience. That is cool. That's cool. So what about you ladies? What, um, anything that you noticed this year about mom that you need to do differently next year or in the future? So I have learned that we focus best whenever we're all at the table, not whenever we're all, you know, sitting in the living room and doing our work in there or anywhere else. You know, we have to be at the table. So that is something that I need to make sure happens so that we focus and we get our work done. Awesome. Very good, very good. Yeah. Well, I have the same situation with um, socialization. I'm an introvert, um, so my children have become introverts. <laughs> and um, in the last year or two, I've tried to improve with that. I mean, we don't have a lot of homeschoolers in our area, and we have one car. So um, it's difficult to get out. And then, of course, you know, you want to be selective about the activities. So, but um, now it seems as if, you know, <laughs> A crimp has been put in that. I don't know how much progress we're going to make mm -hmm. this coming year with that. But I do get concerned. You know, they seem to be um, pretty shy. And um, although people, you know, really like them and tell me they're such good kids and um, they're helpful, they're polite. But as far as, like Selena said, you know, <laughs> engaging with people, concerned about that. Oh, yeah. So I know I have to get out of my own shell mm. and um, try to make that happen for them, especially, I mean, the older one's 16 now. Mm -hmm. He's got about four more years of school, but um, it's time, you know. And uh, I don't know where we're going to go now with this development in right. society. Yeah. Oh, yeah, that's it's good to be aware of that and realize that that's something that you have to stretch. I'm the opposite. I'm an extrovert. So there have been years when my, <laughs> yes, Selena, um, there have been years where my need to get out and see people and do things has taken over our homeschool. And so we haven't gotten the work done or it hasn't been more, most beneficial to my kids. And um, there have been years that I would answer that. And I would say, I, we were left the house too much. Um, I've gotten better about that, especially now that I can, I can go out and leave the older two home and I, you know, we can still do stuff and kind of, they can still get their work done. But um, I think for me this year, what's interesting is this requirement to stay home has taught me um, that I just, it's, it's going to sound really funny and I, I'm not good about just doing the thing that needs done. <laughs> I mean, yeah. I do the thing that I want to do, or I do the mm -hmm. thing that um, is right in front of me maybe and keep putting off the stuff that's, you know, most important. And so with my husband home, 
granted, there is that extra like, oh, he's here and he's going <laughs> to see that we're schooling or not schooling. Yeah, he's watching. And it's, it's not that he would ever, I mean, he would say something if he noticed we were like doing no school. But it's more of, you know, how when you, when you have friends over, you yell at your kids less when you're having a play date, they might do the same exact thing with the kids over and their fit. But if your friend is there, you're just not going to yell at them. Um, yeah. So I, I have a friend and I, we have, we have, we had bad days and we would actually say, Hey, I'm having a bad day and I'm yelling. Can you come over so that we can not yell <laughs> for the rest of the day? Cause it works. Cause you're, you're so less likely to just explode in front of another person. Anyway. So I'm seeing with my husband home, we are being much more consistent in schooling. And I've tried a lot of things. Um, to be better about schooling my younger kids. Now that my big kids are like completely independent, it's very tempting to be like, yeah, the younger ones can just do some here and do some there because we don't have to, you know, plow through it. Um, but we've been home and we've been schooling more than we have before. And it's not bad. I think mm -hmm. we had a couple bad years. Um, and I think that conditioned my brain and my mind to think, I don't want to do this schooling thing with some of these kids as, you know, as regularly as I should, even though it wasn't a conscious thought. And I'm realizing in the past couple of weeks that we're getting it done. It's enjoyable for the most mm -hmm. part. There are not as many meltdowns as there were a year or two ago over the same stuff. We're able to, we've all matured and we've all kind of figured things out. So I think for me, moving into next year, I need to figure out a way to remind myself that and just, you know, do the work every day and sit down and do it. And um, because they're making really good progress and it, it's really great to see. And we're also enjoying that time together uh, more often than I was previously. It wasn't like I was skipping school completely all the time. It was just more like, eh, let's just do a few things here or let's do it after lunch or let's push it up, you know, do double up tomorrow. And I just wasn't being as consistent. And so the consistency is really going good. I mean, I even did Pam Barnhill's consistency boot camp like twice. <laughs> Didn't help. I mean, she's fantastic. She had all the right ideas and she had all the right like steps. But about halfway through, I would be like, I don't want to do this. It's too hard. I don't want to do this. I don't want to. I don't. It's boring. I don't want to do the same thing every day. <laughs> but um, I guess I didn't get past that. Whereas now I'm doing the same thing every day because I have that external like, you know, eyes watching and it's. I've gotten past the hump and I'm like, yes, this is doable and good. And I still have time the rest of the day to do what I need to do and want to do and think is important. Um, but I can put that most important thing, my children's education, you know, as that priority that it really act the way my priorities are. So that's my mama thing. True confessions here. <laughs> um, so like I said, all these thoughts and all these evaluations, we can take, you know, what we've just said and put those into, you know, into planning, into moving forward. And um, on our second Zoom call, what we talked about why we homeschool and the benefits of homeschooling. And we talked about making a list or a paragraph or phrase or whatever it is to put at the front of your planner that says, this is why we homeschool. I think, um, you know, the next step is writing down these thoughts and these goals for what worked, what didn't work, what do I want it to look like next year? So the goal setting becomes, okay, I saw these successes. Let's make sure to keep a note of those so we can continue that. I saw these um, struggles. How can I overcome some of them? And some of them you can't overcome. Let's say that too. Sometimes there's struggles and they're going to be struggles K through 12 or, you know, age zero to 18. There are some struggles that are always going to be struggles. Um, but to kind of acknowledge those and consider those and be like, okay, I'm not a morning person. So we are not starting school at 645 in the morning like Lindsay. <laughs> but I do need to start school before like 10 because otherwise I get kind of blah and the rest of the day just get scattered. Selena, you were going to say something. Oh, just the idea of some things are never going to be fixed. I'm like being a homeschool, staying home all day, that'll never be happy and that'll never be joyful for me. Yeah. And this, this lifestyle can't continue forever of what we're being quarantined. So, but that was one of the things that we had to acknowledge that we can never stay home all day, every day. We will have to, we will need to do something every day, mm -hmm. something, whatever, whatever that is for me. 
and for my ex two extrovert children. The introvert can stay home. She's fine. She, d she does have some prescripted social things every week. <laughs> yeah. But like the one of the things, the constant is you have to acknowledge your personality and your children have to see you acknowledge your personality and take care of how God created you. Yes. Yes. That's so key because we're not just, I mean, we know this, but we have to say it out loud. We are not just teaching our kids reading and writing and math and religion. We are teaching them how to be adults because they're watching us and we're who they're with all day long. And so they are seeing the choices that we make and saying, when I get older and when I grow up, I mean, whether it's subconscious or conscious, I want to do this. I don't want to do this. And so by, especially as women, by acknowledging who we are and what it looks like to be a healthy mom, we're teaching our daughters how to do that. We're teaching our sons who to marry. Um, and what their expectations should be. Um, I talk about that with my husband sometimes. I'm like, so I've noticed that you're doing X, Y, Z and I'm doing X, Y, Z. Do we want our boys to marry someone who, you know, in this relationship, because we look at it from that perspective, we want our daughter to, you know, enter into that. Um, you kind of think about things and it becomes more important to do it better uh, because we are training them. I love that. Kind of mental jump it's hard to think of our kids all grown up and marrying people and having their own family but if my, if they grow up with a a parent who is unhealthy in some way or not acknowledging you know who they are then that's going to be their expectation of what adulthood looks like so it's, it's important um final question here um it's kind of a big one but i think this is the question that all the people are asking anyway, so it shouldn't be too hard. Um, what questions <laughs> came out funny? Do you need answered in order to have a successful next year coming year? Like what in your mind is the, are a couple, there's like probably dozens, you could write out pages of this, but what things are you questioning now that you need to either research or find answers or pray about or discern or think about or look up? What is it? What's your question about the coming year? Uh, are my children thriving in their relationships with their peers? Hmm. So we, we have some, so a couple of extracurriculars that we love that really foster relationships. And this is non-Catholic peers, Catholic peers, age peers and non-age peers so they have a variety of activities we do that happen once or twice a week or once or twice a month are they thriving in that activity and that doesn't necessarily mean are they happy maybe basically are they growing in their in their faith are they stretching their personality are they asking to spend time with these people even though they're different from them mm -hmm. and is there a group, a person, or a family in that curricular that we do feel comfortable having over for dinner? And if that's true, then we stick with it the next year. Um, the other question I really ask is, am I, am I growing in relationship with my child? Is whatever curriculum, whatever book, whatever system, is this fostering relationship or is this putting up walls? And if it's putting up walls, then scrap it. Don't do it again. So... Those are the main questions we ask. Like that. You know, I'm big on relationship and that that's, that's, that's more important than anything we could teach them is that we have a good relationship with our kids and that we love them. That's awesome. Marianne, what do you think? Um, now, what was the specific question again? It was, it sorry. Was, <laughs> it was what questions are you either asking now or need to ask? Yeah. Well, I just, I think I've kind of already discussed it. What do I, I continue with the same thing, you know, the same curriculum, whatever, same way of operating with my, you know, first son. The answer is probably no, but now, so where do I go from there? With my other son, he specifically wants to continue with Seton, um, but in a way he spends so much time on it because it's very demanding 
um, is he really growing in ways he should be at, at his age because he's you know getting up there <laughs> towards adulthood mm -hmm. so um, I'm just concerned about whether he really should continue with that or or what I can do to help it also help him to grow other ways so it seems like a lot <laughs> to me it's overwhelming <laughs> yeah it is a lot in high school I I think that's a really excellent question is that how how are we spending our time? How is he spending his time? But in general, just how is each person in our family spending their time? Because there can be something that's really, really good and really, really good. But if you can't fit in something else that's essential mm -hmm. or, you know, that that's mm -hmm. something you right. have to look at. And this staying at home thing has made us all start thinking about that, right? You can't yeah. deny that. You're like, oh, did I need to be doing X, Y, Z? Or was that the most beneficial thing? Or spending time doing that? Was that, you know, was that the best decision? Those are good questions. Good questions. Charlotte? What all can I put my children in to get them out of the house more? <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> I, I, our schedule, like we dropped two things with all of this. That's it. <laughs> you know, there's, and one of them CCD. I mean, yeah. So I've got to find something that I can put them in mm -hmm. that they can build more of those relationships. A lot of them are at our local library, a lot of the programs that we did. And to see my introvert daughter upset that she's no longer going to book club or craft club or pet club, like she misses the girls and she misses the instruction and she misses the time with, because they were other homeschool families. Right. Um, because, and you know, and I understand a public school child is exhausted at the end of the day. They don't want to go to the library and spend another hour being told what to do. They don't. So it was all homeschooled children that were in this craft club together and they loved it. I mean, so cool. it was a drop off program for ages eight to 12 and the 12 year olds had younger siblings in the class and it was a blast and they loved it. And she had all her stuff from this past year on her shelf. She's like, are they going to have it again? When are we doing this again? That's Mom, will you craft with me? I'm like, I hate crafts. <laughs> I hate crafts too. Oh, I, I don't. I kit. But here's a kit. I don't even buy the kits. <laughs> 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 they give them as gifts and I give them away again. Oh, okay. Well. But we've been crafting. Nothing else to do. <laughs> I'm something else to do in the afternoon. Sorry, I had to back away there for a minute, but changing plans in the next hour. So he was like, I got to talk to you. Um, so I heard the bit about Charlotte wanting to get her kids out of the house more. And the thing that came to mind is, I think especially as homeschoolers, that is so hard to make good decisions about. Because A, we have to be home to homeschool. There's no denying that. You have to have some hours at home. B, um, a lot of the things that are out there in my experience, it's like an all or nothing. It's like, this will either consume your entire life or you don't do it. And there's a season for that. And our family's definitely chosen that in some ways. Um, a season for, yes, we're gonna do this because this kid needs this and we are all in and it's gonna take up a lot of time. Um, but finding those um, activities that have the right balance of time away from the home, maybe, mom prep time or not prep time, you know, the obligation, the supplies, the expense, the, or just the time being there and how productive that is, is really hard. There's no perfect, you know, answer. I love that craft club sounds amazing, but I have people contact me all the time about co-ops and support groups and things I can get my kids involved in. And, you know, a lot of people find their niche and they find their group and it works well for them and that's enough. But a lot of people bounce. We, we always bounce because, you know, one thing is too much mom prep time or one time is just too much time away from the house or it's too far away or not enough or the wrong people, you know, the people come, my kids don't connect. And 
I think it's a constant, um, we've settled into a really kind of philosophy of just, we try things for a short period of time. And I tell my kids, we're just doing this for two months. So we're just doing this for eight weeks. If it requires like a full year, we're very less likely to commit to it because of that, because our family dynamics are different than the average family, the most public, you know, public school families. So it's tricky to find that, but it's a really good question to ask. You have to ask your time away from home and what that looks like and how beneficial that is. Excellent questions. Um, yeah, so I have a million questions too. I mean, that I ask myself and that I need to ask myself specifically about next year. Um, and I won't go into all the details because they're really specific about my kids. But I think overall in general, I, I wanna ask myself and I wanna look at our materials and what we're planning to do and think about two things. Um, how is this developing their faith? Um, and how is this bringing um, joy to our home? Because I, that, that is one thing, the joy part that I'm not great at. I'm kind of just a, let's just do it. And there's, we don't, you know, the silly and the laughing and the fun and the, it's like, eh, no, stop. <laughs> let's just, let's just do it. Um, and so I would like to see that play more into my choices that I'm making and kind of make some good choices. I did a few this year and I was like, that really went well. So I, I need to ask myself those questions is how is this impacting our faith? Is my, are my kids faith life being enriched? And then is it bringing joy? Um, because it's different for each kid, you know, on what that's going to mean. But I think overall I can kind of ask those things and help make those decisions, even if it's, you know, a school subject that's less, that's not religion or isn't specific. So, so many good things, so many good things to think about. So those things, as I mentioned, turn into, okay, so these are the questions I need to wrestle with as I'm looking at all the materials or as I'm looking at which pr program I want to pick. Cause I know that we're going to have moms watch this replay that are like, I just want to pick something and go with it. That's hard too, because you're not, there's no perfect fit. Um, but choosing a box or choosing to enroll in a program can be incredibly helpful to some families, to a lot of families. Um, I want to say most, maybe, I don't know. At some point, most families probably do that because they need that because it's important. Um, but you have to figure out what questions you need to ask. We didn't all ask the same questions and that's what a survey like this or, you know, spending time looking through your year and what you did. Um, or talking to other homeschool moms or just talking to your husband, having that space in your brain to think about these things and figure out what does it look like for my family? What are the right answers for my family? Because the questions are all different. So the answers are all going to be different too. And we can't, there's no cookie cutter stamp on what's going to be best for this year. And, um, and that goes for people who've been doing the same box curriculum for, you know, 10 years. Um, box is not a bad word. Um, but I guarantee you they didn't do it the same way year to year. You know, maybe they adjusted. They did math first for a really long time because they needed to. And then they realized we wanted to do something more fun first and they switched. You know, I mean, you still have a lot of choices that we're making as moms, um, you know, no matter what program or path you follow, um, which quite honestly is kind of the most burdensome thing about being a homeschool mom to me. It's all the decisions, all the choices. I mean, a mom anyway decides what my kids are going to wear and eat and, you know, but now we're homeschooling. So now we're going to decide what they're going to learn, who their friends are going to be, what activities are going to be. I mean, we have so many, many choices that it, that makes it all the more important that we really reflect on our priorities. We really reflect on what's working, what's not working, where do I want my kids to be um, and not forget to think these big thoughts. So I know that um, one of my favorite ways to plan my homeschool year is using Pam Barnhill's plan your year book and course. Um, and I do it every year since it's come out because it's a very good methodical process in planning the upcoming year. Um, and she starts out with what is your vision for your homeschool and what are your goals for your kids? And she walks you through step by step on figuring out what that looks like. And I still do that every year. I look at my vision from last year and I think, Hmm, What's changed? What's the same? How do I need to adapt this? You know, and set goals for each kid. Um, 
because otherwise, if you jump right into the catalogs, right now, I would say, if you go right to the conferences, but there are no conferences, <laughs> um, you're just, you're, you can make choices that without really considering who your children are, who your family is, because it looks shiny and new and fun and it might work. So those are my thoughts. Any closing thoughts from you ladies on this whole process of just getting in your head and going through this and thinking through, cause we're going to start like Sunday talking curriculum because that's the next step is okay. So I guess my thoughts on making space to have these thoughts, even with young children is that it doesn't have to look perfect. They can watch TV and eat popcorn for dinner. And if the evening time is the best time for you to have these thoughts, to shut your door and take some time to think, let it happen. Last year when I was doing my lesson planning, they watched, I think, two days straight of TV and I felt zero guilt because I know they have TV days at school. I know they have days of just parties at schools for the teachers to have some time to rest, to have conferences, to give them a chance to sit at their desk and think. So take that time for yourself. Let the kids watch too much TV for a couple of days or let them play on their devices for too much just so you can have the space to think. Was there aftermath that I had to put up with? Absolutely, and it was worth every minute of it because we had a chance to grow in grace and mercy. Mm -hmm. um, but I got that space to think and to reflect and to ponder and to plan yeah. and to not just baptism by fire, do what I think is the next right thing, but actually take the time to think about it. That's awesome. I've been known to set a timer and do that and say, mom is going to work for 30 minutes. And I say work, but really it's like, you know, journal and answer questions and look at things. Um, and I'm right here, but I'm working, you know, because otherwise if you don't designate the time, then when, when I get into the nitty gritty of planning, yeah, I take out chunks, hours of time. I schedule it on the count family calendar. This is mom planning time because teachers have um, teacher work days. And they have lots of meetings and curriculum obligations, you know, where they're getting training and so forth. We need that too. Um, but it has to be scheduled. I think that's a really key point. You have to just make the time. It's hard. I mean, with all the kids underfoot, the movies, then them outside, they're playing and breaking up fights. But to still say, maybe this is my hour to work. I might only get 30 minutes to work <laughs> because I'm interrupted. But this is the time. To have these thoughts. Awesome. Other closing thoughts or things Marianne or Charlotte want to share? Well, I'd be interested in <laughs> learning how to plan because it's not really something I've ever done a lot of. Um, most I use box curriculum. Uh, maybe did a little more for my younger son this year. Um, but basically it was day by day, not advance and I think that's probably been quite detrimental <laughs> not having a long range plan sure. so I'm looking forward to figuring that out with some help <laughs> yeah we'll definitely be talking about those things it's it looks different for everybody but you can mm -hmm. you know you can definitely kind of go through the thought process together mm -hmm. okay, good oh you're still muted you can head now Charlotte, you're waving. <laughs> okay, good, good. Well, I am grateful that you guys spent this time with me to chit chat, and I hope that some of the things we said would be a blessing to others, you know, who watch this and who need to, to hear these things. So thank you for sharing. Thank you for being here. I hope that it helps you in your headspace. Think about these things, because that's really why I do these things. I would be doing this in person with my friends at coffee dates if we weren't doing Zooms because otherwise I don't make the time mm -hmm. to think. I don't have the time or, or, or create the quiet to be able to go through these processes in my own head. So normally this looks for me like a coffee date once a week with a friend and then getting together with a big group of friends to talk curriculum and then you know another one. I'm from probably April through June, I'm constantly like hosting stuff and meeting people because this is the way I make sure that I think about it and do the important the important work that needs done to, to plan my kids. So thank you for joining me. And okay, thank you. We will be meeting again on Sunday evening to talk curriculum. And I'm 
working out the details on making sure I get some people lined up to talk about specific programs and why they work for them. Okay. Um, hopefully that will all work out. So say a prayer that the right people are there to, to share. Okay. Okay. Thank you.